Welcome back, students, to the next section of this exam. Please make sure to subscribe because I'm going to post a lot more videos that are going to help you with this exam. The exam is right around the corner, so make sure you press that bell to make sure that you get notified. Hello, cyber students. Welcome to part four. This video is going to be a long one because we're finishing all of B2. We did this beautiful graph in part three, and now we're going to do the rest of B2 and part C in this one video. And let's get started. So we did 47 in the previous video, so let's move on to the next question. Base your answer to questions 48 and 49 on the graph below and on your knowledge of biology. The graph shows the changes in population over a period of time. Okay, so what did I always say? When you have a question that has a diagram, a graph, a picture, a photo, you need to look and see, well, what are you looking at? What's going on here? Okay, so let's take a look at the x-axis time, so in years. So this is time passing by. Here we have population size, okay? So this is some kind of species. This could be an animal. Um, this could be, let's say, squirrels, okay? And then population changes. So what's happening here is that there's a certain amount of squirrels, right? They're not mentioning squirrels. I'm just giving an example of a species. Use your imagination. Have fun with this. So squirrels. There's a certain amount of squirrels here. Don't worry about the fact that there's no numbers here. You know that at, as time passes, the number of squirrels is increasing and increasing and increasing. And then it reaches a capacity where it no longer goes higher up. They start dying out, then they come back up, dying out, coming back up, lower, lower number of squirrels being reproduced, higher number of squirrels. This right here is a perfect example of carrying capacity. Now, in this video, I want you to look at the comment section. In the comment section, I'm going to put, I'm going to link other videos of amazing people who have posted about content. If you don't know what carrying capacity is after this question, um, I highly suggest that you go to the videos and you watch what carrying capacity is so you have a, a, a really solid, good understanding besides just me talking about it. Carrying capacity is the limit as to how the environment can support a living organism. For example, squirrels. There's only a certain amount of space, a certain amount of food for the squirrels, a certain amount of competition, a certain amount of energy, of resources. It can only support, let's say that in this particular, in, in this particular environment, it's only able to support 100 squirrels. That's it. More than 100 squirrels, they're not going to survive because there isn't enough food. There isn't enough space or shelter. There isn't enough water. We can keep going, right? Carrying capacity is the limit of the resources that are available for that organism. And I, and I was just using squirrels as an example. So, and heads up, these type of, of diagrams, they do not change. Meaning that once you see a, a graph like this, that it's going to go up and squiggle carrying capacity. I don't want to focus in on that because I don't want there to be some kind of like squiggly, something similar. You're like carrying capacity and it's actually like something else like heart rates. So, but just know that this is a very common characteristic of a graph when speaking of carrying capacity. Okay, so let me just clear the um, page so that we can now get to the question, now that we know what this uh, graph is talking about. Explain one likely reason for the population size changes, as indicated by the graph between years five and 10. Okay, from years five and 10, we have a very specific situation is going on where you're not getting any more increase. You get the increase and decrease. So 
it's at a limit here. The squirrels are not getting enough food to continue to increase their population or not enough resources. So explain one likely reason for population size changes, okay? So one thing that we write is that the population reached its carrying capacity. You have to use your scientific vocabulary. You have to say that because that's telling the teacher or the person grading your exam that you know what's going on. Then you explain a reason why. It could be the reason, the one likely reason can be whatever you want it to be, anything, okay? It could be that there isn't enough food, there isn't... um their, you know, the, the birth rates varied from year to year. So we're going to keep it with food. So we're going to put probably not enough resources such as food. Done. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, number 49. One factor that could result in an increase in the population size after year 10 would be, I don't care if your test looks like this at the end. You are gonna annotate. You are going to make sure that you understand what is the question, <clears throat> excuse me, what is the question asking, okay? So they want you to read these four choices and see which one of these four choices is going to increase the amount of squirrel population for after 10 years, okay? So let's see number one, increased competi competition within species, absolutely not. If you're increasing competition, if the squirrel is competing with another species, let's say a skunk, and they both eat the same thing, for example, let's say, I don't know what skunks eat, um, but let's say they're competing for the same food, they're not, that's gonna decrease the amount of squirrels, okay? Additional food became available. Absolutely. If more food becomes available, more resources, then that can possibly increase the, the, pop, the population size. Next, predators of the species became more numerous, so more things killing the squirrels? No. A new parasite negatively affected reproduction in the species. What? A disease? A parasite, a pathogen? Absolutely not. So the best answer for 49 is choice two. Okay, let's move on to the next question. I love that you can just fast forward this if you don't want me, <laughs> if you don't want to like stick around for the directions, but I'm reading every single word on these exams. Okay, base your answer to questions 50 and 51. Okay, so this is 50 and 51. On the graph below and on your knowledge of biology, the graph shows how the population growth rate of several species of fish is affected by temperature. Okay, remember, look at the graph and just speak in your head though. Don't speak out loud so teachers don't think that you're going crazy while you're taking the test or think you're cheating. Read in your head. So let's take a look and see what is this graph talking about. The influence of temperature of the growth rates of fish, okay. So different temperatures affect different types of fish in the way that they grow. There's a rainbow fish, there's the yellow perch, and then there's large mouth bass, okay? So three different fish, right? And here's the temperature, okay, in degrees Celsius, it's increasing. And then the population growth, so, I know they don't number it, but let's put some numbers here just for context, right? Okay. So the higher up you are here, the more number of fish you're going to get. So right here at the top is where you have the highest number of successful growth rates, okay? So for the rainbow trout, the best temperature is about nine degrees Celsius. For the yellow perch, the best temperature is 20. For the largemouth bass, the best temperature 
is about 32, 31, 33. Okay, so now we know what's going on with the graph. So now let's go ahead and answer the question. What is the most favorable temperature for the growth of the yellow perch? I'm going to annotate that. Population. Okay, yellow perch. R yellow perch is right here. And we said the best one. Is it 10? No. Is it 15? No. Is it 30? No. It's 20. That was easy. All right, guys. So let's take a look at number 51. Okay. Okay. So let's take a look at number 51. Several industries use water from a lake to cool their machinery. When this water is returned to the lake, it has been warmed by several degrees. Select one of the fish species and describe one way that a, that a temperature increase from 20 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius could affect the growth rate of that species. Okay, so they want us to look at 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. So 20 is here. If this is 30, then this right halfway is 25, okay? So they want us to look at this area right here. And you are to choose one of these three fish and talk about how this um, temperature increase of 20, to 20, 20 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius would affect a fish that you choose. So... Let's say you chose the rainbow trout. So you have to write that down. You chose rainbow trout. I can't tell you how many students leave this thing blank or they don't read the, the question carefully and they just put some questionable thing here. Like, no, they're just asking you to pick one of the three things. Okay, so we chose rainbow trout. If the temperature is between 20 and 25, it's not gonna do anything to the rainbow trout because let's follow the rainbow trout, okay? This is the rainbow trout and there is nothing happening here. So the temperature increase has no effect. on the rainbow trout that we used. I know what you're saying. If you haven't seen my previous videos, I'm going to repeat this and I'm not going to say this again. My handwriting sucks, but look at my handwriting. Can you read it? Yes, you can. If your handwriting is not beautiful and perfect and cursive, actually, we're going to talk about cursive real quick. You... Uh, just need to make sure that you, that the person, that people can read your handwriting, okay? The reason my handwriting is like this is because I'm on an iPad. I'm not used to writing on an iPad, but I have to emphasize this. Okay, let's take a look. Let's say if you chose um, the yellow perch. Okay, so let's give yellow perch a different highlight color. Let's take a look. This is the yellow perch. There's definitely something going on here. It hit our uh, temperature range. So for the yellow for the yellow perch, the yellow perch growth rate would decrease in the amount uh, in that temperature range. So in this temperature range, let me uh, erase this so that you can see it better. So this is the yellow perch. Okay from 20 to 25 it's going down it's going down so if you had chosen the yellow perch this temperature makes them decrease in growth okay i think you get the point now let's say if you chose the largemouth bass okay so let's give largemouth bass a different highlight. Large mouth bass is here. This is our range, 20 and 25. The large mouth bass increases in growth rate in this temperature. Okay, but we chose the rainbow trout and this has no effect on 
the rainbow trout because it stops right here okay all right let's move on all right so let's continue to number 52 I'm not gonna lie, this exam, it's it's higher level. There's a lot of questions that don't have a lot of diagrams and depend so much on your knowledge of what you learned in this class, but you got this. You're here, you're studying with me. So let's get let's get to it. Okay, number 52. The male peacock illustrated below attracts females by fanning out his very long tail feathers. In an elaborate display however the large fan of colorful feathers makes the males more noticeable to predators and makes it difficult for them to escape explain why male peacocks continue to have large feathers even though having the feathers may make them more likely to be killed by predators okay why do they have the elaborate feathers because it attracts females. Why do they need to attract females? They need to attract females to reproduce. Okay? So, explain why the male peacock continue to have large feather feathers. Peacock males continue to have large tail feathers. To attract females to reproduce period okay let's move on to the next question no more peacock remember super important to read the directions base your answer to questions 53 and 55 in the information below and on your knowledge of biology so this is all pertaining to the same concept of this tiny literature over here. This one depends a lot on your knowledge of the cell and enzymes. Proteins are, are an important part of any diet. Many kinds of food can provide the proteins that we need. Okay, question number 55. State what hap must happen to protein molecules in food before cells can use them. Whatever you eat, anything that you eat, you chew it with your teeth, mechanical digestion, and then in your stomach with the hydrochloric acid and the, and the enzymes, you then chemically digest it. You have to break down the food so that it becomes into smaller pieces, smaller molecules, so that you can then absorb them in your small intestine. State what must happen to protein molecules Protein molecules must be digested or broken down into smaller molecules so that cells can use them. How does protein get into a cell? By the process of diffusion. You want to get fancy with it? You want to say that? Fine. But this is all that we're asking for. That's all you need to answer. Okay. Let's take a look at number 54. Identify the structure in a cell where proteins are synthesized. What organelle is responsible for protein synthesis? Hmm? You learned this in class when you learned about the organelles. So this one, either you know it or you don't know it. Proteins are synthesized by ribosomes. If right now you're thinking to yourself, what? When did we study this? When did in class did we talk about ribosomes? You absolutely did. Science teachers have to go through all of the major organelles, the nucleus, the mitochondria, the ribosome, the lysosome, endoplasmic reticulum, the cell membrane, the cell wall, all of that, the, the Golgi apparatus, maybe not, not necessarily for this class, but 
when we teach it, we have to teach all of it. And students forget about the ribosomes a lot. Okay? So this one was ribosomes. Last one. Identify which characteristic of protein molecule allows it to perform a specific function. S specific function, protein. What do you think this is talking about? When this is talking about a protein that has a job to do, has a job to do, okay? What about the protein is so important for it to do its function? First of all, this is talking about enzymes. Enzymes have to be a specific shape. It's talking about a characteristic. So what about the protein? Okay, proteins must have a specific shape in order to function properly. And if you forgot, let's say this is an enzyme right in order for this to work with a molecule that it's either going to make or break it has to fit perfectly let's say this is the molecule that's going to be processed and then this is the enzyme it has to be a lock and key lock and key okay in order for it to work. All right, let's move on to part C. Okay, here it is. The famous questions, the style of questions where students give up. It's an hour and a half later. This is questions, you know, 56 to 58. And, and we have to go all the way up to 72 in this video. I don't care if this video takes me three hours to do. We're going to get this done. And I'm going to let you know all the tips and tricks of how to do this. Do not give up. At this point, when you see this and you're like, oh my gosh, like no diagrams. This is all my knowledge. Take your time. This is the part that you really need to show up. And I'm going to give you a very important tip that I don't want you to forget. Okay. We're going to read all of this. And then we're going to get started. Part C. We made it to part C, guys. Answer all questions in this part. Directions, 56 to 72. Record your answers in the space provided in this examination booklet. You're writing this in pen. You are not writing this in pencil. Base your answer to questions 56 to 58 on the information below and on your knowledge of biology. Eco ecological succession and evolution are both processes that involve changes over time. However, these two processes are different. Okay. I put two videos in the description box. I mean, I put a bunch of videos in the description box and labeled them about what is ecological succession and what is evolution. I handpicked those videos for one, them being short and them giving the correct information that you need for this test, okay? Ecological succession is when you have a bare area, let's say that a volcano erupted and it erupted on a forest and it killed all of the plants and animals and trees. And now just I just want you to imagine a very vacant land with just rocks and pebbles. Over a period of time, that that rocks, those rocks and that land that has nothing will eventually turn into a forest. But it takes time. The video on the description box that I linked is going to be very descriptive of what ecological succession is. Evolution is a change in species over a very long period of time. For example... Did you know that horses used to be the size of a chihuahua? We know this from fossil records. We found the bone structure of a, of a horse and it was tiny. Millions of years have passed and now we know horses as how we know them now. They're very, very large animals. And we've also had a hand in that. We have done selective breeding for 
horses that are race horses and maybe there are competitions out there of who has the largest horse two very different situations here let's see what they want from us okay explain how ecological succession differs from evolution in your answer be sure to pay attention to what i'm about to say you see these bullet points you have to answer in bullet points Okay, answer in bullet points. If you do not do this, you're going to have the teacher trying to find answers. Well, where's their answer? Oh, I don't see it. Wrong, wrong, wrong. I can't see it. I can't understand their handwriting. It's all a mess. You are not doing that because you saw my video and you are going to be, again, your handwriting doesn't matter. Just make it legible. They have to be able to read it. You are going to be the most amazing student and you're going to start with the bullet. And you know what else you're going to do? You're going to you're going to number them. This is 56. This is 57. This is 58. OK, first bullet point number 56. No problem, teacher. You're going to read my answers. Describe the specific kinds of changes that occur when ecological succession takes place. A barren land. turns into a lush forest period period number 57 bullet point describe one way that a population of red foxes could be affected as a result of ecological succession in the habitat if the habitat is changing the food can change if the if the red fox is really um it really depends on a specific type of plant that it's eating or a specific type of, you know, shelter that it's getting from specific plants. And then it changes over time because ecological su succession changes, then it can affect the survival of the red fox. So one way the population of red fox could be affected. So one way the population of red fox can be affected are the changes in vegetative vegetation okay i i'm pretty sure i did not vegetation i'm not sure if i spelled this correctly but listen this is a perfect example of how you just try your best okay one way the population of red fox can af can be affected are the changes in vegetation. The change in resources can affect the fox. Period. Number 58. Okay. Describe one way that a population of red foxes could be changed as a result of evolution. Okay, this one is saying, how can a red fox change? How can it evolve over time? Okay, one way that animals change is to survive their env environment. And this happens through the process of natural selection. Natural selection. This is a theory that Charles Darwin discovered. And I'm sure that you remember this from class, okay? That you studied Charles Darwin, natural selection, evolution. Leave the comment section. Let me know. Did you study this in class or did you not? Do you remember or do you not? Let me know. Okay. One way that the red fox can change is by a mutation. To better survive its changing environment, okay? Very simple. Oh, thank you. I literally got a comment from... Uh, one of you guys so thank you i really appreciate um the thanks and i and i am so 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 happy that my videos are helping you okay so one way that a population of red foxes could be changed 
is by mutation, DNA mutation, to better survive. It's changing environment, period. All right, guys, let's continue. So here we have, base your answer to questions 59 through 61 on the information below and on your knowledge of biology. Students, this one is a doozy. This one is a high level reading. It's not much, it's only three small paragraphs, but they have here some pretty high level, hard to pronounce words, scientific words here. They're speaking of bacteria, okay? So you're not in a competition to know how to read, okay? You're not reading this out loud, but you're reading it to yourself. So even if you mispronounce it or you don't know how to pronounce it, take your time in pronouncing it so that you know what you're referring to when you're being asked the questions. So when you find yourself reading something on a test, on this test, and you can't organize your thoughts, there's too much information going on, there's too many words, too much is going on here. You're going to first look at the questions and see what they're looking for. That's the first thing that I want you to do when the reading is just too unorganized for you. And then you start getting nervous and what information they're asking for. So first, go to the question and see what they want. So let's see what 59 is going to ask. State one concern that doctors might have about using S. So this is pronounced lugdunensis to treat MRSA. Don't worry about it. We haven't read anything yet, so don't worry about what that is. Number 59 wants you to state one concern. So we're going to put the word concern here to keep us um, on the lookout for a concern. Okay, 60. State one way that antibiotic form by S. lugdunensis is different from most other antibiotics. So how is S. lugdunensis different from other antibiotics? So we're going to put the word different here. Different. Sorry, this is slippery. Okay, number 61. Describe one observation made by scientists that led them to think that lug lugdunen would be effective against MRSA. So this one has a, a couple of parts. So I like the word observation. So we're going to put observation up here, okay? And we're going to put the word lugdunen, okay? An observation of lugdunen, of this particular um, word here. Now that we know that they want a concern, what is different and an observation, we can now go and start our reading. So let's read together. Scientists have found what they think could be an important weapon in the fight against superbugs, and it lives in your nose. A new antibiotic made by nose-dwelling bacteria, Staphylococcus lugdunensis, which is also called S. lugdunensis, has been found to kill drug-resistant MRSA, Staphylococcus aureus. So, MRSA is Staphylococcus aureus, okay? S aureus is MRSA, which, is, which kills up to 10,000 people a year in the United State, States. This is also called a staph infection, I was going to say, raise your hand if you've ever heard of a staph infection, and then some of you would have raised your hand if you were in my class. So this is caused, this staph infection is an infection that's caused by Staphylococcus um, aureus, and it does kill up to 10,000 people a year. Okay, let's keep going. As a result of swabbing noses, scientists discovered that MR, MRSA, which we said was the staph infection, and S. lugdunensis, are rarely found together. This discovery supports the idea that S. lugdunensis helps in fighting off MRSA. Let's pause here. We're already in the middle. And let's take a look at the questions and see if we are, can already answer any of these. 
state one concern that doctors might have about we haven't reached a concern yet state one way that the antibiotic formed by S. lugdunensis is different from most other antibiotics? Uh, I don't think we've reached that either. Describe one observation made by scientists that led to think that lugdunensis would affect, would be, I think we should keep reading. Let's keep reading so we can get more information. This bacterium produces an antibiotic called lugdunin. Okay, so we know that this word is located here for number 61, no problem, which prevents MRSA from growing in the Petri dishes. When applied to the skin of mice infected with MRSA, it reduces or eliminates the infection. We found the answer to number 61, so I'm going to highlight this, okay, because this is the reason why we think one observation made by scientists that led them to think that lugdunin would be effective against MRSA? Well, here it is. When lugdunin is applied to the skin of mice infected with MRSA, it reduces or eliminates the infection. So we write that down for number 61. When applied, when actually we need to be very specific. Okay, and you're writing this trying to write this in your own words, when lugdunin was applied to the skin of mice, the infection reduced or was eliminated eliminated period okay so we got 61 okay let's keep reading mrsa shows no sign of antibiotic resistance to lugdunin this to me looks like a different sounds like a difference mrsa shows no signs of antibiotic resistance to lugdunin okay let's keep going Although S. lugdunensis is effective in treating MRSA infections, it carries its own risk of causing infections in the, con in the heart, joints, skin, and eyes. We found the answer to 59, or a answer to number 59, a concern. So, although S. lugdunensis is effective in treating MRSA infections, it carries its own risk. Risk is a concern, Okay. So what's a concern? So we're going to write that down. Okay. Doctors are concerned that S. lugdunensis will cause an infection to the heart joints, skin, and eyes, period. Okay, let's finish reading. Normally, antibiotics are formed by soil bacteria and fungi. The idea that human bacteria may be a source of antimicrobial agents is a new discovery. A new class of antibiotics like this has not been found since 1980. So side thing, I think it's pretty cool that your nose makes um, like an antibiotic that, you know, kills strep, MRSA. Okay, so we just found the difference. State one difference that the antibiotic S. lugdunensis is different from other antibiotics. And what do they say? This is made in the nose. An other antibiotic is made in soil. Okay? So one difference, you don't have to mention both. You can just mention one difference of S. lugdunensis is that it makes antibiotics in the human nose. Okay, there it is. We've answered all three questions. 
All right, guys, let's move on to number 62 and 63. Base your answer to the question 62 and 63 on the information below and on your knowledge of biology. So let's do the same uh, trick that I taught you with the previous reading. Let's take a look at the questions first, and then we're going to read, okay? And we're going to annotate, and we're going to... Um, focus in on what is the question asking? What is the big word or the couple of words that let you understand what it's asking for? Okay, number 62. Identify one life function. Okay, they want us to talk about a life function that lysosomes help the cell carry out and describe how they help the cell perform this function. Okay, life functions. You have excretion, digestion, respiration, reproduction, and so on and so on, just to name a few. The lysosome is an organelle. This is found inside of a cell. So in a cell, you have the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria, the ribosomes the lysosome is a very special organelle okay like my little drawing of the animal cell okay so now that we know that they want us to figure out what kind of life function does the lysosome do for the cell now to let the cell carry out whatever needs to carry out okay so we are at the cellular level we're not talking about the heart the stomach we're not talking about the human body system, we're talking about the cell and the function that the lysosome has on that cell. Okay, let's take a look at number 63. Identify one additional cell structure and describe how the structure that you have selected interacts with the lysosome to carry out a specific cell function. Okay, this is high level right here. You need to know another organelle that works with the lysosome to help the lysosome finish what it needs to do, okay? So let's go ahead and start reading and then let's answer the questions the best that we can. Lysosomes are cellular organelles that have the ability to break down large organic compounds. Break down, that is digestion. That life function is digestion. Or old worn out cell organelles. Some of the products that are produced are a result of this breakdown process can be reused as building blocks, while other products are released as waste from the cell. Waste, release as waste from the cell, that is excretion. I'm not going to do any more because for 62, it only asks for one. Let's keep going. Recently, studies have shown that lysosomes are more than just garbage disposals. New research has shown that lysosomes have the ability to sense how well nourished a cell is. If lysosomes detect that there is a lack of nutrients for energy, the organelle prompts the cell to produce more enzymes. These enzymes can break down fat reserves and other cellular materials that could help that could be used as a source of energy. On the other hand, if the cell has an abundance of nutrients, signals are sent from the lysosomes that prompt the cell to grow and divide. Grow and divide, that is reproduction. I, I know I said I stopped, but I have to say this one. Making more cells. Okay, so we have digestion, excretion, reproduction. So here you can pick any. So let me just erase uh, just so that for those who find it very distracting. Okay, identify one life function from the lysosome. So let's say here digestion, a life function, digestion. And describe how they help the cell perform. Okay, they help the cell perform. So lysosome are cell organelles that have the ability to break down large. Okay, so the lysosome helps break down large organic compounds. And 
and worn out cell organelles. Helps to clean. Okay. I want you to realize that this I got from the reading. And it's okay if you put it word for word with a couple of changes. It's okay. The point is that you understood a life function and you and you answered the part that says to describe how it helps with the cell for the for the lysosome to do what it needs to do. Okay. Let's take a look at 63. Identify one additional cell structure and describe how the structure that you have selected interacts with the lysosome. Okay. So I'm going to choose one that you know, I have in mind, I'm going to choose excretion because whenever the cell has to excrete a waste, it has to be removed by the cell membrane, okay? So the cell structure, cell membrane, for those of you who do not know what the cell membrane is, this is a cell, that's the nucleus, this is the endoplasmic reticulum, here's the mitochondria, a lysosome, a large vacuole, the cell membrane is the outermost layer of an animal cell, okay? In a plant cell, which is kind of squared like, you see two layers. It's the inner part, the outside. Do you know what the outermost layer of a cell, of a plant cell is? Cell wall, okay? So cell membrane is the outermost layer. The cell membrane allows what enters or leaves the cell, okay? So now it says, describe how the structure that you have selected interacts with the lysosome, okay, to carry out its function. When the lysosome needs to excrete waste the cell membrane allows for removal woohoo period oh these qu i'm sweating guys i'm sweating these questions are not easy, but they are when you take your time and you annotate and you take notes if you need to on your scrap paper and you look at the question and figure out what do they want and you read and you pause and then you read and pause and go back. I'm really hoping that this helps for these particular questions. Okay, let's move on to the next one. All right, this is number 6465, another question that really depends on your background knowledge and not too much on what's happening over here. So a couple of things I want to ask you and I want you to think about it. In class, did you study HIV AIDS? Did you study that disease that is called, it's, it's caused by the HIV virus? Did you study vaccines and what, what does the body produce when you give someone a vaccine? Did you study of what's in a vaccine? Very important uh, moment right now because there is always a vaccine question. What is a vaccine made up of? And what does a vaccine do? What does your, how does your body respond to a vaccine? Okay, so let's go ahead and read the directions and the reading. Base your answers to questions 64 and 65 on the information below and on your knowledge of biology. Okay, 64 and 65 pertain to this reading here. HVTN702, a new vaccine. In November 2016, a new vaccine against HIV was tested in South Africa in a study identified as HVTN702. The vaccine has been developed to protect against the HVTN702 strain that is most common in South, Southern Africa, the strain of HIV AIDS. So there's a specific strain of HIV AIDS called HVTN702 in South Africa. It is hoped that the new vaccine will provide greater and more long-lasting protection. Okay, protection against what? 
protection against HIV AIDS. Okay? The H HIV AIDS virus. Vaccines protect against viruses. Okay? All right, let's see number 64. Explain why most people who are infected with HIV generally do not die from the virus itself, but instead from infections caused by other viruses or bacteria. Okay, I want to emphasize that vaccines only protect from viruses, not bacteria. Vaccines protect from viruses. Specific vaccines protect from specific viruses, and I'll get to that in a second. There's a reason why I sound like a broken record right now. The question is asking about bacteria, right? But but this is just saying, why is it that people die from infections uh, and diseases caused by viruses and bacteria, not necessarily from the HIV virus? Because do you know what the HIV virus does to a person? Think, of, Answer this question first. What human body system does the HIV virus effect the immune system the immune system your immune system makes the white blood cells necessary to kill off any pathogens what are pathogens pathogens invade your body and give you some kind of disease and it's either a virus bacteria fungus or parasite those are the four right okay hiv harms a human's immune system specifically white blood cell count is lower this prevents humans from fighting off disease, period, okay? This one was your own knowledge, unfortunately. This was not something that you can get from the reading. So I'm so happy that you found my video so that you can now look into and learn about HIV AIDS, okay? or. Get your notes from class of when you spoke about HIV AIDS and look at those questions and those notes again. Let's look at number 65. Describe what a vaccine, such as the one in the HVTN702 trial, might contain, let's annotate contain, that would help to prevent an HIV infection in an individual. Okay. The H. VTN702 vaccine contains the dead or weakened virus of the specific HIV AIDS strain found in Africa. Now I'm going to add some things down here. Okay. I'm going to add some things. <laughs> Let me try that again. <laughs> Let me try that again. Okay. Hopefully it perfect. Okay. That's better. Okay. So what I want to add is I want to emphasize different types of vaccines and what's in them. Let's start with the one that we know is the most recent one, the COVID vaccine. The COVID vaccine, did you take it? It's okay if you didn't. But what does the COVID vaccine have in it that when you get the vaccine, you then make the antibodies to protect you against the, the vaccine out in the future? COVID vaccine has the dead or weakened COVID virus. 
Do you get flu shots? I don't, but I should. I always get sick from the flu. And I never thought it was serious until I got the flu this time around. And it almost killed me. It was really bad. But what is inside the flu vaccine? The actual flu. The dead or weakened flu virus. Now, I think you got the point. So when you get a vaccine, it's not something magical that's in there. If you get the flu vaccine, the flu is in there. The weakened or dead flu is in there. If you get the COVID vaccine, you are injecting yourself with COVID, but it's dead or weakened. Why? Because when your body picks up this dead or weakened virus, your body makes antibodies specific to what you're getting injected. So you get the flu vaccine your body makes flu antibodies. You get the COVID vaccine, you get COVID antibodies. So then when, let's say you're out and about, and then you come across the flu, the flu, the flu virus, but you got the vaccine, the antibodies come through and be like, get out of here, man. What you trying to do? No, we, we got vaccinated. We're going to kill you off because we recognize you. We are here to tag you and get you out. I got you, bro. You're not going to get sick. Okay, guys, I'm having too much fun with this. All right, let's move on. All right, guys, let's keep going to number 66 and 68, frostbite. So let's read. Okay. Actually, this looks like something that I want to do from before. Read the questions first, annotate it, and then uh, we're going to read. So let's take a look. 66, identify one substance that the blood transports to organ and tissues of the body and explain why the substance is necessary for organs and tissues to continue function. Okay, a substance carried by the blood to support function you know this already we can answer this at least this part without having to read what is a substance that you know the blood carries that goes to all of your cells so that your cells can continue functioning if you said oxygen you're correct so we're going to go ahead and put oxygen we're going to leave why necessary in a second because um we want to read and see if there's anything in there that we want to add to the why necessary. Okay, let's see number 67. Describe how the hunting response helps to preserve functioning of the muscle tissue in your extremities, such as your fingers. We can answer that now, but we're going to wait until we read. 68. Describe one possible long-term result of frostbite. Long-term result of frostbite and explain why this can happen okay we're gonna read because we do need to know context and what they want us to focus on so let's read on frostbite frostbite occurs when tissues freeze this condition happens when you are exposed to temperatures below the freezing point of skin in conditions of prolonged cold exposure your body sends signals to the blood vessels in your arms and legs telling them to constrict narrow by slowing blood flow to the skin your body is able to send more blood to the vital organs supplying them with critical nutrients while also preventing a further decrease in internal body temperature by exposing less blood to the out to the outside cold okay we read half let's see if we can answer any of the questions here okay um, I think we could finish answering number 66. Explain why this substance is necessary for organs and tissues to continue their function well. Oxygen is needed for cellular respiration in all cells to make ATP energy. Done. 66 done. I am hoping that you studied respiration, cellular respiration, 
and that you know that's when the mitochondria in your cell make ATP energy. You need oxygen and glucose sugar to make this to make ATP happen. Okay, so we definitely got 66 under the wraps, no problem. Okay, let's keep reading. Sorry, okay. As this process continues in your extremities, the parts farthest from your heart become colder and colder. A condition called the hunting response is initiated. Your blood vessels are dilated, widened for a period of time, and then constricted again. Periods of dilation are cycled with times of, con of constriction in order to preserve as much function in your extremities as possible. However, when your brain senses that you are in danger of hypothermia, hypothermia is when your body temperature drops significantly below 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, it permanently constricts these blood vessels in order to prevent them from returning cold blood to the internal organs. When this happens, frostbite has begun. Okay. Um, I might put a video on frostbite. I'm not sure. Take a look at the comments, but frostbite can become really intense to where when you're finally hospitalized, they cut off all of the dead skin from the, from your extremities. It could be a toe or it could be a finger, um, because you don't want dead, dense, dead skin to, to be on you. Okay. I'm going to think about it. Let's see what I decided in the count in the description. Okay. Describe how the hunting response helps to preserve functioning of the muscle tissue in your extremities. We just read this. We just read this. So the hunting response periodically sends blood to the fingers. Providing them with the materials required for functioning. Providing them with the materials necessary for functioning. Okay, and we read this. In the reading for the hunting response. Okay, so we're just writing what we learned from the reading. And this could have been, you know, um, however you could have interpreted it. But you have to make sure that you are saying that the hunting response makes sure that your cells get the nutrients that they need to continue function. Okay, last one. Describe one possible long-term result of frostbite and explain why this can happen. Well, as we learned uh, with frostbite, some cells can die. Some cells can die when they do not receive oxygen or glucose from, you know, from this response. So one possible long-term result from frostbite this is when the, the blood is constricted and it can't go to your fingers because it doesn't want to return cold blood to your heart. It wants to keep your core temperature, your organs nice and warm. If your cells do not get the oxygen and nutrients that they need, they will die. Okay, heavy, heavy, heavy questions again. But again, I'm hoping that this um, helps you with how to attack the question by annotating and pausing and looking at the questions first. All right, let's keep going. All right, guys, we've reached the end of part C, so let's get started. Base your answers to questions 69 through 72 on the information below and on your knowledge of biology. So 69 to 72, let's just take a look. 69, 70, 71, 72 pertain to this um ecosystem that we're seeing here this food this is a food this is a food web you've done so much work on this you know you have and if you haven't then that's not good so i just want to show you that 
after this is part D, and this is going to be the last video for this particular exam, okay? All right, so let's get started with our last four questions of this section, part C, okay? So let's go ahead and read what's going on. Kelp Forest Food Web. Kelp forest ecosystems are primarily located in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of California and Alaska. The increased demand for sea urchins, whose role a mass of eggs, is a Japanese sushi ingredient, is causing them to be over-harvested. A team of students is concerned that this decrease might affect the number of other organisms inhabiting a kelp forest ecosystem. The students studied the feeding relationships in the ecosystem and constructed the, the food web shown below. Okay, so here we have a food web. Let's just take a look real quick and kind of start labeling things. So we have, we're starting with the giant kelp algae, okay, which is a plant. Uh, this particular thing here, giant kelp algae, no problem. And then we have snails and a sea urchin and large crab, sea star, large fish and sea otters. Okay, no problem. So I want you to realize the arrows. Let's focus on this arrow over here. Okay, I want you to focus on this large fish. Can you tell me what the large fish eats? Take a look. What does the large fish eat? Does it eat sea otter or does it eat large crabs? Or does it eat a starfish? Take a look at these arrows. What does the large fish eat? The large fish eats large crabs because the energy is flowing from the large crab to the large fish. When you need energy, what do you do? You eat. You eat food. You consume calories. You consume carbohydrates, proteins, fats from your food, sugars, okay? So the arrows are pointing to the flow of energy, okay? So then what does the sea otter eat according to the arrows? So there's a flow of energy. The energy is flowing to the sea otter. The sea otter eats sea urchins. It also eats sea stars. It also eats large crabs. It also eats the large fish. Okay? So let's do one more. Okay? What do sea urchins eat? Look for the arrow that's pointing to the sea urchin. This arrow is pointing to the sea urchin. Sea urchins eat giant kelp algae. Okay? Let's do the snail. What do snails eat? Look at an arrow that's pointing to the snail. This is pointing to the snail. Snails also eat giant large algae. Let's do another one. What does... Let's do the large crab. What does the crab eat? Look for an arrow that's pointing to the large crab. This one's pointing to the large crab. So the large crab also eats the giant kelp algae. Okay. The questions that we're about to do, I just want you to write what you observe in the food web. Write what you observe. Don't worry about trying to explain, overcomplicate things. Let's take a look at the questions and let's see how we can answer them. Number 69, describe one role, okay, let's annotate the role of sea urchin population, okay? They want us to concentrate on the sea urchin. The sea urchin is right here. I'm gonna annotate sea urchin population in the kelp forest ecosystem. Support your answer with information from the food web, okay. What's the role of the sea urchin? The sea urchin eats giant kelp. Okay? Sea urchin eat giant kelp algae. That's it. That that's the role. The role 
is that it eats the giant kelp algae. That's it. Let's move on to number 70. Describe one way a decrease in the number of algae, I'm sorry, in the number of sea urchins. Okay, so let's annotate decrease. The number of sea urchins would affect the population of large fish. Support your answer with the information from the food web. Okay, so let me erase this because I want to make sure <clears throat> we're seeing this correctly decrease in sea urchins okay sea urchins if there is a decrease in sea urchins what kind of effect would it have on the population of the large fish so what would happen to the large fish if there's a decrease in sea urchin well let's see the connection the sea urchin is eaten by sea otters. The large fish is eaten by the sea otters. The sea otter also eats sea stars and it also eats large crabs. No problem. If the sea urchin, if the sea urchin decreases, okay, so if we eliminate or decrease the sea urchin, then the sea otter would eat more of the large fish. So how would it affect? Large fish population will decrease because the sea otters will eat more of them if the sea urchins decrease. Notice how I used a lot of information that came from our food web here. Okay, let's move on to number 72. I'm going to be doing a lot of flipping back and forth. For you, when you take the test, you're going to have both pages in front of you, if that's the case of a particular question. Number 71. Another team of students predicted that if they removed all of the sea stars, okay, so removed all of the sea stars, so let's go back to the, to the web here. If we removed the sea stars, okay, the ecosystem might remain stable. Explain why removing sea stars might seem like a good way to make up for the overharvesting of sea ur urchins. So overharvesting, when you're overhunting, overhunting for the sushi ingredient, right? So if we remove the sea stars, why is that good for the over the over harvesting of sea urchins okay so let's take a look and see why what do the star the sea stars eat okay so look at the arrows that point to the sea stars we have two arrows we have sea urchins and we have the snails if you remove the sea stars this will be a less predator of the sea urchin this will be another uh, one less predator that's trying to eat the sea urchin. So then the number of sea urchins would increase because it's now not just so the sea otter eats it. Right. But then you remove the sea stars and they're no longer going to eat the sea urchins. So that is why it will try to be more stable. OK, so we're going to answer 71. Removing. The sea stars from the ecosystem will increase the number of sea urchins because the sea urchins will have one less predator. Okay. 
I know that you guys can fit could have fit that better in the lines, but I just wanted to make sure that I'm writing large enough so that you can see. Now, notice how I'm just taking information from what I see here. And of course, using my knowledge of science, but I think you could have gotten the point if you would have just put removing the sea stars from the ecosystem will increase the number of sea urchins, period. You would still get the point, I think. But you want to be as detailed as possible, letting that teacher know you know what you're talking about. Last one of the video, number 72, we made it. Explain why removing the sea stars could result in the loss of the entire kelp ecosystem. Okay, so removing sea stars, and then let's take a look at the kelp ecosystem. So let's just concentrate on the sea stars. Okay, so they're saying why, what kind of role would happen if you completely, completely remove the sea stars? Okay, so what kind of role would happen? Okay, just take a look. What would happen if you remove the sea stars? And then it's asking about the kelp ecosystem, about the entire thing. If you remove the sea stars, what will happen to the entire thing? Okay. You can say anything you want about the removal of the sea stars. If you remove the sea stars, so let me just erase this and make it to where we can see it better. If you remove the sea stars, okay, the sea otters will have one less predator the snails will no longer have a predator and then they will increase in numbers okay the sea otter will have one less thing to eat so we can say either one of these three things we already use this so we want to you know keep it fresh and not be repetitive we don't want to teach you to think that we're just randomly answering questions by saying the same thing over and over again so let's use the snail as the example of what we want to say about the kelp forest in general, the kelp forest um, ecosystem, okay? Removing the sea, or the sea stars will eliminate the entire predator of the snails the snails will then rapidly reproduce and start overeating let's see what the snails eat the snails eat the arrow that's pointing to the snails the giant kelp algae will overeat the giant kelp algae, period. We're done with part C, guys. The next and last video of this section is going to be of part D. Please make sure to subscribe because I'm going to post a lot more videos that are going to help you with this exam. The exam is right around the corner, so make sure you press that bell to make sure that you get notified.